Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I've been drinking a lot of coffee to try to get rid of my uh, jet lag. Uh, but fortunately, I have uh, three uh, brilliant co-authors. Chad Bound, who's now at the Peterson Institute for International Economics in Washington, D.C. Samuel uh, Pignagura, uh, a senior economist in our office. And Raymond Robertson, who's a professor at Texas A&M uh, Bush School of uh, Public Policy. And uh, we chose this title before November. Uh, it's unclear we would have chosen a different title after uh, November because uh, we have a lot to say about the Latin American neighborhood. Uh, and at some point, we, we thought of saying toward a renewal of economic integration in, in the Americas. Fortunately, we, we self-censored ourselves. Um, and so this is about this is a report about uh, finding about trying to answer the question of why um, economic integration, which is not just trade, it's also inter integration of factor markets, including migration. So you can already begin to feel why the title is uh, quite fortunate for the times that we're living in today. Um, a key issue that one most economists, and trade economists in particular, um, we ask ourselves whenever we're talking about regional economic integration is why focus on regional integration? Isn't integration with the, with the world superior to regional integration? And roughly speaking, if you were to um, decide what strategy of economic integration is probably more likely to yield uh, gains in terms of efficiency and growth, and this report is about growth and a little bit about volatility. Uh, we're not going to say anything about inequality, uh, though we can discuss it later. But if you were to think about it, like where are the gains from trade like likely to come from economies integrating uh, with other countries, uh, there's a whole host of models that we all got taught in uh, undergraduate and graduate school where the gains from trade are proportional to the differences between countries. So countries can be different because they have different stuff, different endowments, and so we can produce things relatively more efficiently than our trading partners around the globe. And so the gains from trade come from trading with different, different folks. Same thing would be true for Ricardian models of, of trade with growth. And then, broadly speaking, if you move forward a few decades in the literature where there's some, some sort of learning effect from uh, economic integration, um, and there's a lot of uh, papers out there, um, you would want to trade with economies that do a lot of uh, investment in knowledge so you can learn from them and you can uh, import uh, knowledge, either technology or otherwise, through the act of trading, through interactions with people that know more than what you know. And then the third uh, type of uh, criteria that you would think about is whether or not if I increase trade or factor movement with, an, with another economy, is my economy gonna be more stable? Am I gonna be through penetrating other markets, am I going to, and importing from other markets, is my economy going to be more stable, less risky? And uh, um, I have something to say about the similarity part. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, all right. So this is about learning, and the literature has focused a lot on learning through the embedded technology in imports, basically that imports or goods and services, uh, one can reverse engineer them to sort of find out what's the R&D behind them. But more recently, there's a lot of work on trade uh, networks where exporting firms can learn from the network of markets that your trading partners have. And so in the report, we, we report some uh, results from um, econometric analysis on the probability of export survival and export entry. And here we're just showing sort of the marginal effect on the probability of, um, of, of entering a new market 
relative to the effect of a marginal increase in the level of income of your trading partners. Right? And so you can see that the marginal effect on entry is much higher from the network effect. Basically, if you export to Mexico, that it exports to the United States, you can learn how to penetrate the U.S. market. And the, uh, the marginal effects on the probability of survival of an export in the U.S. Uh, will be enhanced if you export first to Mexico and then you learn how to survive in the, in the U.S. market. All right? So can you press back, please? And then can you press diversification? So uh, for this chart, uh, we have a, a paper with Samuel and co-authors where we try to decompose the volatility of global trade into the components that have to do with the volatility of our of, uh, um, supply side exporters versus importers. And the volatility of your overall trade flows depends on the volatility of your partners. And so, after having done the, the composition of variances of uh, trading relations around the world, we present the results from very simple counterfactual exercises, simulations, where we say in counterfactual one, what would happen to the volatility of our exports for Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, etc., if we were to double the share of trade that we have with other Latin American and Caribbean countries, so volatility would increase. The second counterfactual would be uh, what would be the effect on the volatility of our export flows for these Latin American economies if our share of uh, uh, trade with the rest of the world would be halved? And so you can see that by cutting, trading less with the rest of the world, our volatility of trade uh, will go through the roof. All right, can you press back, please? All right, I think we're done there. Thank you. Um, so the bottom line is that um, lack, the lack neighborhood is composed of neighbors that are quite similar. And the closer they're together, the more similar they are. So Trinidad and Tobago is very similar to Venezuela. And Argentina is very similar to Brazil. And Uruguay is similar to Argentina. And Central America looks more like Mexico than they look like Brazil. We invest little in R&D and, and innovation, and we tend to be, for geographic reasons, and in some cases that we'll talk about it later, we tend to be less globalized, so these network effects would also tend to be smaller if we emphasize even more trade with ourselves. So then why pursue regional integration, or why, why, why care about it? And it's because we cannot ignore our neighbors. Geography shapes trade in goods and services as well and as in the movement of people across borders and to a lesser extent capital flows. So, and there's also evidence uh, such as Wolfgang uh, Keller's AER 2002 paper about the fact that even the international transmission of knowledge is dependent on geographic distance and other differences across economies, right? And then in the report, we dedicate a whole chapter to try to convince our readers that um, medium-term growth and even and business cycle is, on business cycles is, 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 is better known. But um, your growth rate tends to look like the growth rate of your neighbors. And that's true throughout the world. Right? And this after controlling, say, for terms of trade, um, shocks that might be different or similar uh, across countries. So we cannot ignore our neighbors, and therefore it's worth thinking about how we can integrate better, deeper, within our neighborhoods so that the whole neighborhood can be more efficient vis-a-vis -vis the global economy and then uh, think about it that way. That it's not really a choice. Geography condemns you to <laughs> to worry about the nature and quality of integration with your immediate neighbors. And there's some uh, very simple examples that we try to develop a little bit in the report. One is that uh, there are certain types of goods and services that get traded across borders, but the cost 
of distance over of transporting those goods and services is so high that they actually only tend to be traded regionally. And therefore, for those types of goods, there's no tension between global integration and regional integration because regional integration means global integration because you are not gonna, for example, import electricity from China. And you're not gonna import transport services, for example, crossing the border between El Salvador and, on, and, and Guatemala from China, right? You're gonna have to build the road, and you, uh, you have to connect the electricity grids, and uh, this trade is, uh, is regional trade because of uh, the barriers to, of geography. And since geography also, in a sense, forces us to trade more with our immediate neighbors, then it matters a lot how our immediate neighbors are themselves integrated with the rest of the world. So then the issue is how, and I'll, I'll, uh, I think the report is very rich in, in sort of academic style uh, research and happy to talk to about the details. But just give me the rest of the, the time, sort of lay out for you the way we see our sort of effort to put forward for the region, for Latin America and the Caribbean, an agenda that is somewhat concrete about how we can improve our neighborhood through an intelligent way of thinking about uh, regional integration and what that means for globalization more generally. So the first item in our um, five-pronged, it's five, five-pronged uh, agenda for the renewal of economic integration uh, in the Americas, I mean Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, one is that there's a pending agenda of uh, sort of liberalization with respect to the rest of the world, uh, in particular the most favored nation uh, tariffs. So in this chart, what we're showing is for the countries that are part of the Pacific Alliance, so that Mexico, Colombia, Chile, and Peru, the Central American and Dominican Republic countries that have a free trade agreement with uh, with the US, and then Mercosur, which is the Southern Cone Customs Union. And so you can see that there's, especially in uh, Mercosur, there was, there's a stalled uh, sort of MFN tariff liberalization because the tariffs in 1995 are essentially the tariffs, the effective MFN tariffs that they have today. And these are the MFN tariffs that you observe in the G7 countries and uh, in, uh, high-performing Asian um, economies. So there's an agenda there about uh, enhancing the integration of certain parts of our neighborhood of Latin America and the Caribbean, where the integration with the rest of the world has remained uh, stagnant uh, for close to 20 years. And then the other issue that is very close to our colleagues, Chad Bounds' uh, research and policy agenda is, has to do with this tariff overhang. So the tariff overhang is the difference between the applied most favored nation tariffs that countries actually uh, implement and their tariff binding that they've negotiated with the WTO when they became members of the WTO. All right? And so um, in the previous graph, the red part was the MFN average tariffs. The, the blue bar takes you all the way to the WTO agree, agreed bindings. And so then, and this is what the G7 looks like. They basically have no water in their tariff binding. Asia has a little bit more, but not as much as some of our expert non-tariff, non-binders. <laughs> um, and the issue here is that uh, there's evidence from relatively reliable academic uh, research, for example, by Nuno Limao at the University of Maryland, that shows that the tariff overhang is not innocuous. It creates uncertainty about what exactly are going to be the tariffs when you decide to export to Brazil. Because Brazil has, in a sense, the freedom, without risking retaliation from WTO members around the world, to sort of raise its MFN tariffs all the way to the tariff binding rates. And that's a lot of water <laughs> to, 
to deal with. And so creates uncertainty, and then that dampens investment in land market in the Caribbean. So that's the second uh, part of the first prong. All right. Now, one thing that is uh, quite interesting, uh, and you observe it in turn part of, of uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, which is that um, um, <laughs> there are clusters of similar economies in the way that I was mentioning before. The South American economies all look, like, look alike, and Mexico and Central America and the Dominican Republic look alike. And so here what we've done is we're presenting uh, a proxy for the similarity of net trade reveal comparative advantage in each group of countries, and then we compare those correlations for within South America between contiguous countries, meaning countries that share a border, others of regional uh, countries. And so look in South America how the level of similarity, both the median and the average, are quite high when you compare it to how similar they are with respect to other regional countries, meaning the rest of Latin America and the Caribbean, and the rest of the world. In Central America and Mexico, sort of a, a similar story, where they, on a net trade basis, they export the same thing, net export basis, right? Uh, but there's greater scope for gains in South America. And then uh, in the Caribbean, it, it, it's the same story. So throughout the Americas, not only do we have uh, the challenge I was talking about earlier of maybe liberalizing further trade with the rest of the world, uh, but also between different subgroups of countries in Latin America and the Caribbean and the rest of uh, Latin America, and in particular where we see more scope for progress in terms of regional Latin American Caribbean integration is between Mercosur and Central America and Mexico and to a lesser extent with the rest of the Pacific Alliance. So this is the transition. All right. Now, the third part of the agenda that we're putting forward in the region or for the region is one that has to do with harmonizing rules, the rules of the game. And so uh, one thing that we don't get in that much detail as we would have liked in the report, but that we do recognize is, is that uh, we're experts at non-tariff measures. Uh, and removing those non-tariff measures, um, um, because of the nature of the measures, those imply efficiency gains that do not cause trade diversion. So it, it sort of dilutes the usual tension between trade diversion and regional integration. But there are other examples. There's uh, Mexico nowadays, for example, has 45 or 44 trade agreements around the world. Chile has even more, right? And each free trade agreement that these countries have has, some, has a chapter that is the longest chapter in each agreement, which is on rules of origin. And these are the rules that define what is a product that's made in Mexico, what is a product that's made in Chile, so that it is eligible for preferential treatment in their trading partners. And so then this creates, uh, so if you are a producer um, in Mexico or, or Chile, and you're producing, uh, you're producing a, a widget, and you are trying to decide where it's more convenient or profitable to export it, you have to sift through, I mean, it's, it's quite, uh, you're probably going to need at least one lawyer to figure it out. Um, and so there's a big push in the region, not only by us, but by, by others, such as the IDB and Ernesto Talvi at uh, the Brookings Institution, that are trying to do a big push about uh, consolidating rules of origin by uh, allowing origin from other Latin, Latin American countries to count as their own national origin. That's essentially the, the agenda. But it goes well beyond just pure commercial uh, policies. For example, in the, uh, particularly affecting uh, these critical regionally traded goods that I was talking about. So um, north of, from Colombia up north, north of the Panama Canal and Central America and Southern Mexico, their electricity grids are connected. But there's very little trade in electricity 
because we haven't figured out the, the uh, re regulation of an international electricity grid, right? And at the very least, if, 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 if we were able to solve this regulatory morass problem, uh, at the very least, the electricity provision in Central America, which is not, a, they do need air conditioning and light. <laughs> Uh, it would, the supply of electricity would be more stable and cheaper. Right. The fourth item in this five-pronged agenda is transport costs, and this is the, this is the same. It has sort of the same at a conceptual level productivity efficiency gains as uh, as a reform that improves uh, productivity, and therefore it doesn't create the tensions between global trade and regional trade. And here we're presenting the report, our estimates for the uh, costs of one extra kilometer of moving merchandise from a gravity model with heterogeneous coefficients. And let's see, is there, yeah, there we go. All right, and so with the rest of the world, we're only uh, Middle East and North Africa and South Asia have a marginal effect of, on, of distance on bilateral trade flows that are more severe than, than ours. And for regional partners, we, we have the costliest kilometer <laughs> in the world. So there's something that is not quite working. It's, uh, it might be an issue of customs reforms, it might be an issue of infrastructure investments at the border or at the points of transactions, ports, as well as, as, well as airports. And so in the report, we're, we're trying to at least put this uh, evidence on the table to have a conversation about that. Right? And so then the fifth prong of the five prong renewal of this agenda is about uh, factor market integration. And so first, let me say a few words about deepening labor market integration. So what we do in the report is that we propose three indicators of labor market integration or any uh, factor market. One has to do with the short-term movement of wages of similar workers using a synthetic cohorts approach across countries. Then there's the long-term wage differential across countries of otherwise similar workers of the same gender, the same age, and the same level of education. Right? And then there's the speed of adjustment to which whenever the, the, there's an equilibrium long-term wage gap between two workers, male workers in Bolivia, and two Chilean workers with the same level of education, that when there's a shock that deviates them from that equilibrium gap, how fast it takes their labor markets to bring it back to the equilibrium uh, wage gap. And then to have benchmarks of what those indicators would look like in the context of labor markets where there is no artificial barrier to the movement of labor, we compare these three indicators to what you would observe within Mexico and within the United States, and then there are some surprising results. First of all, the co-movement, the co-movement of average wages for otherwise similar workers, tends, tends across Latin American countries, tends to be somewhere in between what you observe within uh, Mexico and within the United States. Okay? However, when you come to the average long-term wage gaps, here's where the borders seem to be biting, right? And then the speed of adjustment, here's how fast labor markets within the United States adjust to deviations from long-term equilibrium. In Mexico, it's a little bit better than, so within Mexico, it's a little bit better than uh, within, within Latin America. So if you buy our argument that uh, market integration would bring efficiency gains, then this is something to look at. Um, now, so what we do is we interpret this as, let's assume that more market integration is good for efficiency and perhaps for growth if it has a dynamic effects on learning by enhancing 
um, interpersonal interaction. Right? However, Samuel is not touring the whole of the Americas with this report without being realistic about the challenges of integrating uh, labor markets. So could you hit? Yeah. So one challenge that is, pro I, I don't know if it's particular to Latin America and the Caribbean, is the following is that um, there's a mismatch. If you ask people, where would you want to migrate? Where would you want to work? Relative to where they end up, there's a mismatch. So um, act Actually, Brazil gets a lot, has a very high immigration uh, rate, but very few people from the outside of Brazil, when you ask them, would you want to go live in Brazil, very few of them <laughs> say that they would want to. So the first uh, sort of challenge, if we were to remove borders and allow people to move, it's unclear that they'll end up where they want to and, 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 and want is a welfare variable that we don't study beyond uh, this assertion. The other thing is that at, at, at the cross-country level, the countries that have higher immigration rates are the countries in which the share of the population responds, uh, opinion surveys with a negative attitude towards immigrants. So if, even if countries would want to remove the borders as far as migration is concerned, if migration <laughs> goes against where they want to go, but if migration increases, it is likely that over time there will be a rising resistance from uh, native citizens towards uh, immigrants. So I'm move it back. I'm almost done. All right, so the second part of um, the fifth prong is about capital market. So we present evidence in the report for different types of capital flows that the um, coefficient on distance in a quasi-gravity model of capital flows, the absolute value of the magnitude is uh, lower than for migration or for uh, good, goods and services. Uh, nevertheless, so there, you know, one wonders then why is it that, for example, the Pacific Alliance has uh, invested so much time and effort to um, implement an agreement to have a single trading platform for bonds and securities. And when you read carefully what the Pacific Alliance chapter on this does, is that it harmonizes standards for trading securities across all four uh, securities markets. So in a sense, what they're doing is they're making it not only easier for potential investors in Mexico to invest in Colombia by having a single uh, regulatory framework and platform for trading securities, but even foreign investors that want to invest in Brazil and Mexico now can uh, potentially do it just through the trading platform in Mexico. So um, there's a lot there that it's actually about harmonizing the regulatory environment and simplification so that investment climate in all of the Pacific Alliance improves, thus making the re whole region more attractive to foreign investors. Thank you. So, thank you very much for inviting me to discuss this, to this, this report. I thought, I thought in the beginning it was a paper, then I, I realized it was a long, a long report. So I don't know why they, they, they asked me to, the, the organizers invited me to, to discuss 
or to say something on this report. But what is true is that I, I, I'm in, in charge of a small course on globalization in Catholicism school. And uh, by chance, just when I began to read it, I think that, well, this maybe has something to do. Because one of the, uh, the first of the three topics of this course, uh, I, I decided to, talk, to call it growing together. And, and growing together is very much like this regional integration that you are talking here in this report, even if what I have there in the course is much more questions than answers. Uh, and I think that in this report, maybe still we are, we are having a lot of questions and some answers. So, but, so just, just because we, I just have 10 minutes, so let me, let me just say what, what, I, what I took from this report and some, some comments that I think are really interesting. So I think, I think we have to take some, uh, some points before we begin into the discussion. One is that we know that uh, um, since 2005, since the failure of the WO, uh, uh, round, we stopped doing this increasing multilateral agreement. So then I think it, we, we began to see more and more regional um, arrangements. Uh, and, uh, and, and what, what came then was that these regional agreements was really seen as a second best alternative to the multilateral arrangements. So people understood that we have this by going to regional, you have these costs of uh, uh, diver diverting some, some trade or flows of people, of capital, whatever you think. And um, I, I think that it's always very difficult to quantify how much you gain, how much you lose. So this is something that I think, but, but it was seen as the only way to go. It's not a very, uh, uh, not much, much more, uh, options to, 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 to improve what, what has happened until then. The second thing that I think we have to, 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 to think is that we are talking about a very specific region, so we're not talking about regional agreements in the world. Uh, and, and if you think about Latin America and Caribbean, I think, I think we, we have to take into account that we, we are talking about a, a region that uh, for them, I think the question of not having sustainable growth in the near future is not possible. So the tension to have some policies that can help sustainable growth, it's there very clear. So I think, I think in, we, we, also because they have, they have had this 4% average in the last years, mm -hmm. something that they didn't have in historical terms, and they understood that inequality can be reduced with growth. This was something that for them, in terms of experience, has not been there. So knowing that they can really go to more equal societies through growth, I think this was really a very important experience. When growth stops, in terms of trade begins to improve to them. So now it's something has to be done for, 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 for this process to come back uh, to what, what we saw before. So, so I think that uh, um, uh, this, 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 this tension is there that uh, we, it's clear that the multilateral should be a first best, it's not, it's not an option, and it's not clear what this group of countries should do to improve their probability to grow in a sustainable way. Uh, and that's, and that, so I think that this report is, is really interesting because it crosses these, uh, these two things. So, this, so how can we, through um, development, de developing this regional integration, come out with uh, more sustainable growth? So the, the end is the always growth that is there. And it's a difficult thing. So for us economists to understand how, as Daniel was saying here, to understand how can we make the case that very similar countries in specific regions in, uh, uh, can gain from trade is something that is not easy. So we have observed these clusters of growth and 
regional development in terms of trade across the world, but it's very difficult to say that there's some causality there. So we know that they come together, so regions that grow at low rates, regional integration is low, the others that, that grow fast, regional integration is, 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 is high, but it's, it's very difficult to say that this, what causes what, there's not a third thing that is causing both. So it's very difficult to make the case. I think that one nice thing of the report is that they, they really don't want to avoid the question that what is there that really can help this, this process. And what they come out is with this idea that the regional integration can be a way to go to global integration. So it's not, so it's not because regional integration will be the reason to be able to have a sustainable growth per se, but it will be a way to be able to integrate globally stronger, and this, yes, will be very helpful to growth. And so this complementarity between regional integration and global integration is something that is very different from the substitution, substitution between the two concepts that we have until now, and I think this, this is really important. Uh, and then I think it's, uh, uh, we really have to go a bit deeper in terms of understanding how can we foster this regional integration. And, and I think we have, because I have short time, I, I, let me just put two, two ideas that come out of the, the report. One is, since the, the ultimate, ultimate goal is always growth, I think the question of R&D and uh, knowledge is, is key in this report. And there, the tension that I, that I think we, it's important maybe, maybe to, to go a bit stronger is that we still need to understand what happens in this part of the globe. So I think it's, they make the case, I think, in a nice way that say that, well, we have um, the, 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 ability, the ability to adopt some technology of, of some, or some knowledge can be easier if you have some similarities with your neighbors, then instead you are trying to adopt something that is not really transferable because of different of institutions or, or, or any other thing. But then the question that is really there is then, but you need to have something to be adopted by the group. And then the question why Brazil and Mexico that are the large players are not doing something that we know that scale is really important comes out as something that is not really so. What are the barriers for this country really, really to have some type of research and development that can be then not be adopted by this group? That's, this is, I think, is, a, is an important question. The second question is that they make, I think, in a nice way, is that trading can be a way to learn, and through learning, they, they, there's a way also to increase TFP. And I think the, the focus is very much on exports. They talk a bit about through imports, I can also learn a lot. But when they provide measures, it's not clear that the measures are in, in, in terms of imports. And I think these two these things can be really make the focus in a different way. And then I think they have a different a different focus that I think is also relevant, and maybe it's a way to go on this explanation. That is what Daniel was re talking here about, like developing like public uh, public goods, or something that has some some characteristics of public goods, like energy, transportation, um, finance, telecommunication. So something that really can gain by doing it at the regional level instead of doing it at the, the national level. So, uh, and I think this is a very, mm, we can make the, 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 some sense of if this can be provided together, it will be at a lower cost. Most of these are inputs to, that to be used in most of the products. So that this could really improve trade that then can be glo be, become global. But then the key question is that who will coordinate this, this, this to be there? And the question of regional leaders or some institutional coordination, I think is very important there. So if you look to, if you're being in Europe, we know how these things work. So we have 
we know how the infrastructure was developed in Europe through a, a top-down, very clear policy. It's nothing similar there to occur. So the question is that, that I think it has also to be, to be, to be answered is how the political economy of this question has to be ta tackled. And, and so I think it's, um, I, I, think, I think if maybe if, if the, the gains from this regional integration are more clear, we can really make this as an engine that you would lead to a more cooperation and would lead to the necessary coordination without breaking the, 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 the equilibrium, political equilibrium across this group of, of countries. Just a, a, a last caveat that I think is important, and again, coming from Europe or being in Europe is very important, is that we know that the European uh, Union wa was built in a very gradual way, step by step. And here is where my pessimism is more clear. I don't think that Latin America and Caribbean has the t they have the time to wait that we in Europe had since the very beginning until the point where we are now. And so if you really have to accelerate this process, it's not very clear again how you should go. So I think we have some questions still to develop and to treat, but I think this is clearly the way we should go in terms of tackling the question. So thank you very much for Thank you. Um, many of the things you said I'm going to touch in a slightly different way, so I think we're going to complement one another without having planned it. But first of all, thank you um, for writing this. It's easy to read, very informative. I think there are some un unanswered questions, as Isabel touched upon. Um, I would like to divide my comments into two sections. First, my take of your story, and then two specific questions about the policy implications. The story I understand is about the what, what you've done and why you've done it. And then the how, how do you actually take it to the next level? And in a certain way, perhaps I'm going to ask you to address two questions which you've thought about but probably haven't written enough here. Uh, but let me start with the story. I try to understand what you've written. It's a story about growth, really. This is your starting point. You say growth has fallen back. There's been the element Isabel's referred to that growth is now seen as reducing inequality, bringing about better prosperity. But the, the, the fact is there's lower growth and there's the belief. So the story has a belief, a tension and a complementarity, which you introduced, uh, and then the consequences, which is in your title. So what is the belief? The belief is you can grow more if you integrate more. Um, then you move on to, okay, where's the tension? Uh, to integrate more, you look at the geography. This was, uh, for example, the gravity model. What is traditional sort of gravity model telling us? If you have a big neighbor, big in size, that helps trade. And the further away your partners are in trade, the less you trade because it's more costly. That's the, and you come to the conclusion that distance still matters, even under globalization. Then you took, talk about integration. Integration in two channels. The first channel has to do with the country differences, which you also mentioned here. So countries which are more different have bigger reasons to trade. Um, in Latin America, the neighbors are very similar, so that's a problem. And then the other thing is you learn through trade. You improve technology, knowledge through trade. And there's a friction in that trade. So there you want your learning partners to be close to you. So the tension is sometimes you want your trading partners to be close for certain reasons, but sometimes they need to be a very distant for others. So this is the tension. And of course, this is all taking place in the environment of regions, globalization, so various interactions. And I'm going to refer three levels, national, regional, and global. Those are going to be key to the way I then put the two questions to you. But here we have this tension. How do you resolve it? You resolve it by saying, look, the old integration, which is just focusing on the neighborhood, not good enough. 
The neighborhood has to be more open to the world. That's where you bring in globalization. And you introduce the concept of open in regionalism, OR. How do you do it? The five pillars of the strategy. What are the five pillars? Well, you have three which are really trade-related. Lowering tariffs. You have uh, preferences in relation to your tariff partners. And I threw in another one, the harmonization regulatory approach. You're really focusing on the trade side of things. So three of the five are related to trade. One is already going more to the sort of integration, single market kind of idea, closer to the European model, which is the factor markets. Again, um, that's another step, because now you're trying to integrate production. And you also have an investment policy, which would be the last of the five. Infrastructure, logistics, the idea that you have to have both the soft and hard infrastructure, roads and internet, for example, working together to improve trade. And again, these can be country-specific or regional. So some of the measures work at, would have to be coordinated, as Isabel said, which is not obvious how this would be done. But the point is you have five measures. I would say they go a lot on the integration. And I don't see where the openness is here. Uh, but I agree with you, the two aspects have to be complementary. In other words, you want regions to work for the neighborhood, but also to be more effective on the global stage, which is your key message. Along those lines, I really liked the idea, the African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. Not just because being African, this captures the idea that if you're strong in your neighborhood, you'll be strong in the world. And I would suggest a different title, if you allow me. Fewer fences or walls, if you prefer. Better neighborhood and more growth. That's really what you're wanting. You're wanting to break down barriers increasing the benefits of trade, reducing obviously all the mitigating factors which could affect that trade, but ultimately it's a growth story. And now the two questions. And I ask you to bear in mind the three levels, national, regional, global. At the national level, obviously how you sell this also in countries with huge inequality and great development challenges, how do you sell the idea that more integration is good for growth. So the growth linkages are implicit. There's the belief. We all like to believe that more, tr more integration will bring about better growth and better in in equality and development. But it's not clear. So that would be my first question. What linkages do you envision? The other uh, question I have, in addition to the implementation one, it's not obvious the political economy within the countries and within the regions. For example, you mentioned the Pacific Alliance. There are existing regional trade agreements, alliances, more protectionists sometimes, more liberals, which is one of the reasons the Pacific Alliance came about. They didn't see themselves belonging to the club of many of the existing regional trade agreements. So how would you implement it, a policy question, uh, the growth aspect, and also how do you see it to be more global? How could it become more open? Actually, three questions, but all related. Those would be my comments, but to finalize, it is a very interesting starting point. If you, have, if you bring the linkage to growth and the link to the rest of the world, I think you stand a very good chance of getting policymakers to start listening to you and understanding how they would go about selling this to the electorate and getting the, the bureaucracies to work in the direction you're probably already thinking about. Thank you. Thank you very much for presenting this very interesting report, Daniel. I think, well, it made me think about in this idea of non-rivalry between regional integration and global integration. Honestly, it was not obvious, but all of these discussions have helped me very much understanding. My, my thoughts were more on the migration parts. So, um, in my view, you are slightly pessimistic, meaning you, you say that there are regions here that clearly are in need of immigration, uh, I understand, or uh, even though I did not see the report in all detail that you're mentioning, like more skilled immigration, and then you are worried about what will follow, namely in terms of reactions, okay, like we anti-immigration anti sentiment. So I would say that maybe we can be a bit more optimistic here, and we can try to think, and maybe we have done so already, 
about policies to promote this type of immigration. Um, and I'm thinking, okay, both of positive incentives, but also things such as recognition of qualifications, these kind of things. I mean, all of these, again, to take the European example, all of these has been put in place in Europe, and that's one part of the success of the, well, of the partial success of movement of people within the European Union. So I think it's, I mean, there is something positive that can be done here to promote this type of integration on the one hand, and then on the, yeah, the reaction of people against immigration, I think this is not as obvious. Okay? So what we know about the impact of immigration is that, yes, it tends, it tend or about the winners and the losers of immigration is that lose, I mean, people that lose are essentially the migrants that are already there. But this happens oftentimes at the unskilled level. So if you are talking about skilled immigration, this might be something that actually promotes, I mean, regional um, economic activity. And this actually, I believe there is a chance that people, I mean, locals, they will be happy, they will stay more in their regions, and this can be more of a win-win situation. So that, that was my view here. Thank you. So there's a very um, well-known um, leader of the Caribbean who was a Cambridge and Oxford trained economist in the 1960s, who wrote a book in the 1960s titled um, Caribbean Nationhood and um, Economic Integration. And he has a very uh, famous phrase that says, uh, keep in mind, he was writing in the early 60s when a lot of the Caribbean countries were becoming independent. Um, he said that in a world where power structures matter, it is effective sovereignty and not formal sovereignty that actually matters. And it was his way of trying to promote the idea among all of the, Cari the West Indian nations at that point to accept a sacrifice of sovereignty because the governments would be more effective under an integrated bigger economic unit in providing what the, pop the population needs than in, if they struggled to maintain their uh, uh, cherish sovereignty. And so we're talking about a period of time when these were becoming independent uh, nations. And I think that that is a, it's a, it's a message we're spreading, but that it's not, it's not easy. That governments would become more effective at satisfying the demands of their populations if they uh, leverage regional and global integration. And that's the nature of your, the gist of your of your question. Um, I think that the silver lining in the current world that we live in right now of a global uncertainty and what's going to happen with the global trading system and, uh, you know, when the leaders of the system that has been created are sort of ambivalent about the future curse that they want to take is that in Latin America we actually see a very positive reaction. It's probably the first time in a long, long time that you have Argentina and even Brazil, in spite of everything, all the issues that are troubling them domestically, are talking to the Pacific Alliance. Argentina was admitted earlier this year as an associate member of the Pacific Alliance. March 14th, there was a summit in Viña del Mar, Chile, with all of the TPP members plus one, minus one. The plus one was China, and the minus one was the United States. And so we see in Latin America, even in, the Mer in Mercosur, where the current leaders, however troubled they might be at the time, are looking to their neighbors, and they're looking to the globe more than in a long time. And so I, we don't find it that far of a stretch, and we've been surprised because we finished this report around October and then we were unsure about 
you know, many things, including the title. <laughs> but the reaction has been very positive because it, it's the same phenomenon that China is facing, that all of a sudden they realize that if they want to keep growing, they have to rely on the global economy and then somebody has to take action. And so it's been very, it's been quite interesting to watch. So I, right now, I would tell you that me personally, I think the World Bank group more generally, we're, we're, we're watching this carefully and I think there's, a, there's an opportunity here to, to deploy effective uh, sovereignty. Now one, one, the, one issue that strikes me uh, uh, when I talk to you, uh, Europeans is this, the idea of going slow and deep and that uh, you can stumble. But I think that in the European project, obviously the, the gains go well beyond pure economic and social well-being because we're talking about peace and peace in the world, right? I mean, so the people forget, but I mean, that, that's a pretty large benefit of, uh, of the European experiment. But the, the issue is that here we're talking about integration of goods and services and factor markets. We're not talking about common monetary policies or common fiscal policies. And I think that that is uh, an advantage for the long-term sustainability of this window of opportunity that we observe. Um, the pessimism about uh, migration. Actually, we've been told that we're too optimistic. <laughs> So the, the Europeans and the Americans don't have the monopoly in the world for turning against immigrants. The, uh, this is not gonna be in the press, right? Uh, is this streaming? No? So the first country in all of the Americas in the 21st century that de facto um, started rounding up illegals to kick them out was the Dominican Republic, where close to 50% of the labor force is Haitian. In Costa Rica, they call them the Nicas, which is a, it's an insult to characterize the immigrants from Nicaragua. And it's a country it currently has about a four million people population, of which close to a million were born in Nicaragua. In Costa Rica, it's a welfare state. It's like, it's like a European country. Health and education are free for everybody, as are the pensions for old age. In contrast to the Dominican Republic, in Costa Rica, there's been incredible political resistance to cutting off the social benefits to a quarter of the, of, of the population. And this happens in, in, in Chile, you know, you have both types of voices regarding Bolivians, a country for which there's a lot of border tension. So we're already sort of experiencing some of, so, uh, some of the tension. So I think we come to it with a, a lot of sobriety and uh, as I said, some people call us too optimistic, you call us too pessimistic, and I'm happy about the, the average of those things. Any more questions? Well, I, I, had, um, I had a question which you answered before I asked it, but I still, um, I, I still wanna at least mention it. Because you started your presentation and you ended your uh, presentation with the elephants in the room. United States, you said that from the very beginning, now you threw in China, and of course that's <laughs> Europe. Why? Because of course these are examples in different ways of extremely large markets yeah. that matter at the globe stage. I wanted to you to elaborate on that. Now, I, I, I'm not so sure because probably there's nothing more to say. Let me, however, quote another report of the World Bank, which has an interesting title. Uh, this one is not, by the way. <laughs> uh, we all want better neighbors, don't we? Uh, we Portuguese are a little bit obsessed because there is one neighbor to the west, it's the sea, we're friendly, and there's <laughs> another one and we're friendly too. So, yeah. How can they be better? But anyway, the, 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 it's called uh, Globalization Backlash, 
And the point is that South Asia can benefit from it. So it's, it's kind of a, a stage of what you are saying. Um, if, uh, precisely because of the three levels that uh, Luis uh, uh, mentioned earlier, if globalization is, well, not as dynamic, let's say, in the last few years, some regions that are integrating will gain because the complementarity between the regional and the global is still there, but there's less, perhaps, competition from outside the region. So in a way, what I would have liked, but I guess it's, you know, those are the borders of the departments in the World Bank, would be that some of the lessons of South Asia, um, let alone of, um, again, China. You, you mentioned it, so I, I, really, I really should not yeah. insist on this because uh, you know, we're running out of time and I cannot make negative closing remarks. But anyway, I, 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 I really wanted just to check one more time that U.S. matters, China matters, Europe matters, Africa matters. Thank sure. you. Anybody else? Thank you for, for the presentation and the discussion. In this late hour, I know it's difficult, and you pretend very well not to have a jet lag. Uh, I have a very quick question regarding uh, Latin America. Latin America's integration. It is a puzzle to some extent, being a region which shares a common language, Spanish, and then there's a large country with a language which, albeit it's a different one, although some people believe it's not, it's actually quite similar. So they have something which is rare throughout the world. We don't have that in Europe, for a start. We don't have that, and that's, that's the origin of my question. Regarding the labor market integration, did you come across, you, you compare the United States with Mexico and then with Latin America, I believe. Yeah. Did you come across with data for Europe while researching that? I'll be very curious to know how it compares with yeah. Latin America in, in this case. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, the answer to that one is no. So that's my shortest answer ever to a question in public. Um, I think it would be interesting to, to do it. Uh, and what we presented in the report is using exactly the same methodology so that there's no question. Uh, it's not using synthet synthetic co cohorts. Probably in Europe and within the United States and across European countries, we can do a little, a little better. Uh, so that would be interesting. Um, on um, East Asia, uh, we do talk a little bit about it uh, in the uh, in the report, because in East Asia you do see this phenomenon where intra-regional trade is um, growing in tandem with uh, GDP per capita growth. Now the issue there is that if you had just had growth, intra-regional trade uh, would have emerged. But what we say in the report is that once you take out the, the gravity variables, because one forgets that China, Japan, and South Korea are within a two-hour ship ride from each other. So, I mean, you have the world's largest factory right there with markets in the bill billions of people, right? So it's a, uh, and so once you take that into consideration, uh, the Americas uh, doesn't look like it has a deficit in, in regional integration. It's more of the, the efficiency of that, of that integration. In fact, it, if you include uh, the whole Americas, uh, the, the Americas tends to overtrade if there is such a phenomenon with each other because we've spent 30 years giving each other preferential treatment, so it sort of makes sense. But there's an issue that the gravity variables in East Asia are, are all pushing uh, you towards observing this correlation. It's not obvious where the, where the causality is. What I think it's much more interesting of these economic giants is that somebody has to take leadership in sustaining international institutions and rules uh, because there aren't, there's no judicial jurisdiction over those rules but for the international leadership of the systemically important countries. And that's why it is so encouraging to see sort of a shift in the Chinese attitude where you can take a defensive attitude, think of this as they're being opportunistic for geopolitical purposes, but in the age of uncertainty about who's gonna 
what's going to maintain the international rules when there, there is no policeman really that can do it, one needs these giants uh, to sustain it. So uh, I think the Latin American leaders have the right attitude, which is to embrace it.